So, remember how last week I said that this week was going to be D&D week? I forgot to put the patron poll up early enough to do that, so this is not a D&D video. That will be next week. But anyway, this is what I hope is going to be my only Sunday video focusing on Definitive Edition, because I want most of the other stuff to be separate and distinct from my normal videos, so it doesn't detract from my usual content. So, next week is another Xenoblade 1 thing, but after that we will get back into the normal swing of things. But speculation, analysis, hopes, and thoughts for the current and any future info we get about Definitive Edition will be coming out, just not on Sundays like this. This video is designed for people who have played the original game and beaten it, so if you want to go into the new version blind, don't watch this. Alright, one of people's favorite things about Xenoblade 2 was all the cameos and references to previous games, Xenoblade or otherwise. The big thing, of course, was protagonist from the previous Xenoblade games, Shulk, Fiora, and Elma, showing up in the DLC as playable characters, technically. So, I figured, everyone liked the Land of Challenge. I think nobody thinks that was a bad addition, even people who didn't like the game. So, I'd figure there's a decent chance they'll put something like it in Definitive Edition, but for Xenoblade 1, and hey, why not add a couple new party members as cameos from the Xenoblade games that aren't one? So, Elma again, but then also Rex and Pirate and Mithra. I'm basically going to be putting together movesets for how I would want to implement them. This is how I would do it personally. I'm not expecting it to be exactly like this. This is just how I would handle it. I'm also trying to be realistic since we don't know how long DE was in development and how much brand new content is added. So we don't know exactly how much work is going to be done on this. So I'm going to try to be realistic and these characters will be a bit less complete than one of the main seven party members in the original game and designed in a way to reuse as many assets from older games as possible, just to keep the amount of work you'd actually need to do on these characters down. Also, since making a Xenoblade 1 party member is a lot more complex than a Blade in Xenoblade 2, it's best to keep your expectations low and not expect these to have all of the work done on them that a main party member would. In my hypothetical, the Land of Challenge is first accessible in Colony 6, once you get Juju's speech about reconstruction in a brand new save file. In New Game Plus, it will be located in Colony 9, probably near the Weapons Lab or Dunban's house until then, just like how in New Game Plus the portal to the Land of Challenge was in Argenta before it moved to Oriya. The actual challenges are pretty much the same as Xenoblade 2's challenge mode, just new ones made using Xenoblade 1 or Definitive Edition assets and designed for Xenoblade 1's combat system, so story boss rematches, unique challenges, puzzle type things, things stronger than super bosses, stuff designed to test players beyond what the main game has to offer, although it might not do that if the main game adds things like new areas and new super bosses. Rewards will also be similar, basically you get stuff from beating challenge battles that you can cash in for things, including new outfits, probably a lot of things that are references to older games, or technically future ones if there is X and 2 references, and possibly some extremely broken gear as well, because why not, if you beat the hardest challenge, you might as well get something that can trivialize everything else in the game. Like in Xenoblade 2, temporary party members cannot access challenge battles, that includes Hom's Fiora in New Game Plus, and Melia can't either until the point in the story when you're allowed to change her headgear just because she's in and out of the party so often, and you're missing out on an armor slot until then, so she'd just be really gimped either way. That being said, a possible reward for New Game Plus, like the Torna Blades in Xenoblade 2, could be more fleshed out versions of Dixon, Mumkar, Alvis, Homs Fiora, and any other temporary party members Definitive Edition introduces. It's likely that with Bayana's shoulder being brought back, Vinaya will also join the party as originally intended, so she'd be a playable 8th party member and would need completely new animations, but there are shortcuts that can be made for the temporary 4. Hom's Fiora is much more complete than the others and would just need a few arts to at least get her up to the completeness that my versions of Rex and Elba have, while the other three only have two arts and no talent art. Despite that though, Mumkar could probably pull from Zeke and Morag's Knuckle Claw animations, 
Dixon could use sniper animations from X, and Alvis was already a Shulk clone, so if they wanted to expand their movesets, they at least have a basis for the rest of the animations each one would need to gain a full set of arts and other combat actions like reviving or cheering up a party member. We're not focusing on those things though, just the protagonists of the other two main Xenoblade titles. And we'll start with some stipulations and things that cover both characters, basically just limitations of doing them as cameo characters and not full-fledged parts of the main story, which trust me, I would not want them to be. They'll each get only 8 arts apiece. These can be leveled up like with the main party members, but you do not need to get art bucks to unlock their higher leveled incarnations. Their weapons will work like the Monado and scale damage by level, and better versions that scale better and have more gem slots can be bought from the challenge mode shop, but do not change the weapon's appearance. They would just be core chips from Xenoblade 2 for Rex, and I guess just kits containing dual swords and dual guns for Elma. I'd suggest naming hers after Xenoblade X classes, starting with the Drifter kit and then working their way up to the Full Metal Jaguar kit. They will start out with default personal armor that's on par with what you should have for the recommended level of their unlock mission. So like in Xenoblade 2, you need to complete a mission that would allow you to take them out into Bionis and Mechanis, and the mission would have a recommended level, so the gear they come equipped with would be about equal to normal average gear that a character of about that level would have. They can be equipped with anything that isn't Mechanis armor, but it will not change their appearance. The only exception to that would be removing all of their armor or equipping them in a swimsuit piece, because they do all have swimsuit outfits, so I think that would be a nice thing. You gotta have your naked strats. It's like a Xenoblade staple at this point. They'll also either have only three skill trees, or will start out with all five trees without any personal quests in order to unlock the last two. I did not come up with names for the skill trees for both characters, so that's a thing you could put in the comments. I don't know. Artificially inflate the metrics of this video, please. I like money. They'll also each only get two heart-to-hearts, but each of them will involve them interacting with multiple members of the Xenoblade 1 party, and then there will also be one fifth one, which would involve Shulk interacting with both of them, probably in some form of callback to that amazing conversation between Rex, Shulk, Elma, and Cosmos in Xenoblade 2, but hopefully actually voice acted, even if the robot lady isn't there. So with that, we can start talking specifically about Rex. While Xenoblade 2 is heavy on the customization for all characters, this incarnation of Rex will fight using just the Aegis Sword and Pyra and Mithra as his blade. Preferably, this incarnation of the character would be designed by Kunihiko Tanaka, because as of this point, he is the only Xeno protagonist to not get that treatment. Shulk was originally not designed by him, but he and Fiora's Xenoblade 2 incarnations were, so I think he gotta complete the cycle. Unfortunately, it seems like Tanaka has left Monolith Soft for good, but it might be possible to get him back just to do one last guest thing before he formally passes the reins of the Xeno series over to whoever the lead character designer of the next brand new Xeno project is. He'd of course be redesigned a little bit to fit better with Xenoblade 1's character style. My guess would be his proportions would be similar to Juju. Rex is 15, Shulk, Ryan, and Fiora are all 18. Juju comes off as a bit younger even than 15, probably more like 13, but Rex is a very short 15 year old, so I could see him being easily mistakable for a 13 year old in this design. Pyra and Mithra, Vinaya is really the only character with a remotely similar body shape to them in Xenoblade 1, so while they would look a lot more human or Homs than Machina, their body shapes would probably be something along the lines of a shorter Vinaya. The Aegis will follow Rex around in battle with the usual line between them, and that will turn gold at max tension because tension and Xenoblade 2 battle affinity are pretty much the same mechanic. Sticking close to your blade will give Rex a small buff to all his stats. You could possibly increase this via his skill trees, of course those skills could not be linked over to other characters, and by hitting max tension. His auto attacks will function like Xenoblade 1 auto attacks, so you can use them while moving, but you can still cancel your arts off of them in order to deal a bit more damage. The animation for his auto attack would also be a tweaked version of the Aegis Sword auto-attack animation from Xenoblade 2 to allow him to move around 
while still attacking in the exact same rhythm as in his original game, so people who are used to cancelling in Xenoblade 2 would be able to pick it up pretty quickly in this game. His arts, while coming in different colors to suit what they actually are, will also come in two completely distinct varieties. Driver arts and blade specials. Almost all of these use animations directly pulled from Xenoblade 2, but re-rigged to fit the character's new proportions if necessary. We'll go over the driver arts since they're basically normal Xenoblade 1 arts before we talk about what the blade specials do. First off, Sword Bash, it's a backslash clone. Double Spinning Edge, hits twice on a single target and deals increased damage when attacking from the side. Rolling Smash is a slight AoE around the target and will reduce aggro on Rex from all the enemies that are damaged. Anchor Shot damages a single enemy, it will topple the enemy if they're inflicted with break, and spawns a small health potion on the field that when picked up will heal a small amount of HP to the entire party, but like smaller than the weakest healing art by at least half because you don't want this to be a big source of healing. It doesn't really vibe well with the Xenoblade 1 system. So all of these work basically how normal Xenoblade 1 arts do and are literally his Aegis Sword art ported over into one's battle system, but the blade specials are a bit different. They start out uncharged at the beginning of a fight, unlike every other art in the game, and take a very long time to charge up, but build up more the more you use driver art, so they could be built up from both driver arts and auto-attacking, and if you cancel driver arts off of auto-attacks, they'll charge up even more. These attacks are also all ether-based while the driver arts are physical. Rex's talent art, which gets built up by using everything and even more from canceling, turns Pyra into Mithra for a little while, increasing power and charging up the blade specials. The talent gauge will drain over time while Mithra is out, and you can turn it off at will if you want to drop down to Pyra's specials, and it will keep whatever charge was remaining in it when you do so. Each special animation is pulled directly from Xenoblade 2, but all of them, especially the level 4s, are shortened a bit to, again, better fit with Xenoblade 1's combat style, and the fact that you don't want the game to actively pause when you're using Rex and only Rex. Also, specials that were higher level in Xenoblade 2 take longer to charge up. For Pyra, you've got Flame Nova, which is a single hit AoE centered on Rex that deals increased damage to beast type enemies. Enemy types beyond like flying and not flying and immune to certain statuses and not immune to certain statuses aren't really a thing in Xenoblade 1, but I think a beast type is relatively straightforward enough for that to be easy to implement into the game. Her second is Prominence Revolt, which is a single target, single hit attack that deals increased damage on toppled enemies and inflicts daze. Her third is Blazing End, a single target multi-hit attack that deals more damage on a crit than it would normally be done. And finally, Burning Sword is two hits. One is a stronger hit on one target, and then the second is a weaker AoE centered on that target, with no additional effects. Mithra's specials are Ray of Punishment, which is a single target, single hit attack that deals increased damage to dazed enemies. This has the same effect as Mithra's level 2 Prominence Revolt in Xenoblade 2 itself, but I changed it to increased damage on dazed instead of increased damage on topple, so it's actually more distinct from that art to keep Pirate and Mithra a bit more different from each other. Her second is Photon Edge, which is a single target multi-hit attack that will ignore enemy defense if it hits. Her third is Lightning Buster, another single target multi-hit attack, I think you're getting a pattern here, but this one, its damage will increase as Rex's HP decreases. And finally, Hadron Impact, a single target powerful multi-hit combo, again it's just straight damage, but this one is focused on one target instead of multiple. And it's not Sacred Hour, despite that being more iconic, because hey, Siren didn't come across the rift to the Xenoblade 1 universe, only Pyra and Mithra did. And so, we move on to Elma. Unfortunately, fortunately, depends on how you look at it, Xenoblade X's battle system is a lot closer to 1's than 2's was, so there's a bit less work that needs to be done to make Elma play like her original incarnation in this game, which means this segment will be a lot shorter than the Rex one. First off, her Xenoblade 2 redesign would work perfectly alongside Xenoblade 1 characters as well. The only thing that might need to be changed up a bit is the colors, depending on whether or not they choose to wash out the colors again like the original game, or stick with the lighter, more Xenoblade 2-like color palette in the final version of Definitive Edition. 
She will fight using both dual swords and dual guns, like her classic combat style from X. Her auto attack will swap between the two of them if you move closer or further from a targeted enemy. So you'll either get a lot of small hits on a longer interval or two stronger hits on a shorter one. These will charge up talent gauge the exact same amount though. Her arts are tied to either a melee or a ranged weapon, and as such will have secondary cooldowns like an X that increase their effectiveness in various ways, but the secondary cooldown will only fill when the weapon they're tied to is out, so distance positioning is important to Elma as well. Her talent art is of course Overdrive. It functions roughly the same way as it has in both of its previous appearances, including the mechanic of tertiary cooldowns from Xenoblade X. However, activating it does not drain the party gauge like it did in Xenoblade 2, only Elma's talent gauge. The gauge will empty completely when you use it and then the overdrive timer will start. When in overdrive, keeping a combo of the same color going will also refill talent gauge, and you can extend overdrive by activating it again if you fill it back up. Overdrive counter increase works in chain attacks as well, and executing a color combo in a chain attack will add a bonus to the counter if you're in overdrive when you activate the chain attack, the additional numbers will be added on once the attack ends, and of course you can reactivate overdrive to count as a white art. Elma's melee arts are Shadow Strike, which inflicts a break and also deals increased damage from behind. Shadow Runner is an aura that decreases aggro and aggro gain, while also boosting attack and back attack damage. Electric Surge is an ether attack that deals more damage the lower Elma's HP is. And then we've got a bit of an interesting one, Thirsty Shells. I didn't want to give her two auras for her melee arts, but I liked Thirsty Edges Restore HP on Impact, and I also liked 100 Shells Large Multi-Hit, so it's basically a combination of that. It's a single target multi-hit attack that restores HP based on the damage dealt. For her ranged arts, Ghost Factory grants decoy to the entire party. This takes a long time to recharge and only protects against like 3 or 4 hits per person because decoy is busted and would be even more busted in Xenoblade 1 than it was in X, so you want to keep it a bit tempered compared to its original version. Of course, she also has Sliding Slinger, which deals damage and moves Elma a bit of a distance, increasing talent gauge when attacking from the side. Violent Streak is an AoE circular attack, multi-hit centered on Elma, and critical hits with those increase tension. And finally, Executioner is basically just a regular attack, with some chance of inflicting instant death under some criteria other than days that I can't think of right now, just to distinguish it a bit more from Charlotte's Headshaker. I know that we had a bunch of backslash clones just in here, and there are a bunch of backslash clones in the original game, but I don't know, I just wanted to make Executioner a bit different. I guess just to show that Elma's guns are more useful than Charlotte's gun? I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that. The one change I would make, though, even if there aren't any new instant death arts in Definitive Edition, is to make Headshot do a lot more damage if you make the instant death chance on an enemy that's immune to it. So, it deals a bit of damage, but if you hit a dazed target, there's a small chance that if it's not immune to instant death, it'll just get insta-killed, and if it is immune to instant death, it'll just take a lot more damage. So, yeah, uh, that's all I got. I guess leave your opinions on these ideas in the comments if you got any. And, of course, they gotta do the one thing. The other thing. Where, if you have one of these characters on the field, if you got Rex, you could get you'll recall our names to replace you will know our names. And for Elma, you could get the best Xenoblade song of all time on Control, but goodbye. Honestly, I have to say, I'm just getting incredibly more degenerate with these outros the further I get, which is probably because I have never, I have had YouTube channels before this one, and I have never been good at intros or outros whatsoever, so I wasted my good ones in the couple years I've had this channel now, and I, it's just getting worse and worse the further we go, but yeah, that's really... I don't have anything else to say about that. I'm basically just buying time for the thing with the patron names and then for the thing with the uh, end card stuff. But I think I've bought about enough time for that now. So thank you for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. Don't do the opposite of any of those things. And until next time, this is Luxon signing off.